When we looked at this, er, this day, we wanted to cover something that was related to a very common dilemma. Most of the cases that we treat are usually related to extraction sites or extraction site defects. And you've seen already two strategies, uh, multiple strategies, therefore, that have been related to trying to maintain aesthetics, maintain contour, and deliver consistent results. So what Howie and I are going to speak about is sort of how this all played out for us in terms of partial extraction therapy. For us, we call it the final frontier because it has actually morphed into that for us as we've looked over our cases over the last several years. Now, I do have to say some of what's been touched upon with anything that is new is that we have to test the waters. We have to get early adopters to share information. And that's happened through Howie, myself, Jonathan, South Africa, who's been great with our articles and helping us along, but also with our ability to share on Dental XP through what we call crowdsource learning and sharing, crowdsource research, if you will. Finding others that want to be early adopters who feel comfortable and experienced enough, and many of them are here in the audience and many of them are going to be presenting. Juan Alberto, of course, is here, and uh, Ramon Gomez, and we have many, many others. As a matter of fact, Danny has ITI, uh, we have JTI. And uh, this was a consensus conference that brought together a lot of these early adopters to discuss this format and this concept of partial extraction therapy. And this took place in Madrid in November. So we had an opportunity of trying to see where everybody was at. Many of the people in the audience, some of you are, were at that meeting and understand. Because if you take a look at some of these cases in front of the screen here, and I know Urs and Danny and Dennis and Steven showed beautiful work, absolutely exquisite. And yet, if you looked at each one of these slides, these are all implants that were done utilizing partial extraction therapy. And our concepts really relate to us is, how do we do this predictably? How we and I sat together and mulled over this via Skype, through chats, you know, unlike the other guys who work in the same city and location, Howie and I were quite a distance away, but we had an opportunity of really sharing our information and trying to get a feel of where we were with this. And we want to talk about predictability. We're going to share with you one group's version of what that is. For us, as much as we want to focus on the entire contour of the labial plate and the entire depth of the vestibule and look at all of these things, invariably, the focus point that I think all of our eyes captured is an area that Henry and I and David have been speaking about for the last several years. Our focal point has been as a team in Atlanta, what we call the transition zone. And that transition uh, zone is where the bone and the soft tissue meets the restoration. That very small area that may in fact only be four, maybe five millimeters in most cases, depending on the depth of implant placement. And we talk about the pink and white metrics. And if we take a look at a case such as this one, I think we will all agree on the fact that it is very, very difficult for us to ascertain that anything was done. And yet in that same transition zone, we obviously all have our failures and our angst when it comes to being able to deliver this in this area in a predictable way. So if we take a look at the transition zone here, whether this was done as immediates, which they were, whether the implants were placed poorly, whether the hard and soft tissue weren't grafted. I don't really know what the techniques were, but invariably, these are failures. And failures that, as Urs said earlier, how do we focus on repair? How can we actually repair cases? If you're going to do a procedure, you also have to know what your fallback options are going to be. And how are you going to take a look at that with us later on? So when we take a look at this zone, this transition zone, how are we and I going to try to focus on those four to five millimeters, the area that is typically in view in a high and medium lip line case? We're going to focus there. And partial extraction therapy, or therapies if you wish, for those of the, that don't know what we're alluding to, is the maintenance of all or a portion of the root being left behind on purpose using a specific technique and being done in a way that fools the body into maintaining the periodontal ligament and the attachment of that periodontal ligament to the bone. We look at root submergence. 
which we first published on in 2007, and that eventually led to Socket Shield with Hertzler's group, and then of course, as well, Pontic Shield with Howie and I and Jonathan years later. So what are we all here for? Why are we so interested? Why is this room, even on a beautiful sunny day in Florida, still full? Is because we all know how important these decisions are. Our patients are depending on us. They look upon us for that, that accuracy, that precision. So once a tooth is extracted, we know, and Howie and I, all of us here, a clinician in this room should choose a treatment with a high predictability of a successful outcome that also meets the patient's expectations. It should have a low or manageable risk of complication, and it should be compatible with his or her skill level. I can tell you that some of us in the room, it, when this is all done, may feel more comfortable with one of the techniques over the other, and that is also fine. But we must be realistic, and I think that Howie and I are going to try to drive that point. So what are the evidence-based strategies that we feel right now that we evaluate, that we have looked at, that we have actually tried? Each and every one of them Howie and I have done. And I think that in our office and his office in South Africa, we had similar, uh, often similar responses of the tissue and the bone. One of them would be to extract and wait. It could be delayed, it could be early as Danny showed, and then some type of contour GBR. It could be extract and graft with immediate placement and dual zone therapies. It can also be extract and graft with implant placement and SVG, or surgical veneer grafting. And the Agnini brothers were really uh, awesome to work with. They took this thing and looked at it with me and said, hey, let's take a look if we add tissue in the tissue zone rather than add bone in the bone zone. What would it do? And uh, we're hopeful we'll be pu publishing the longer term data on that technique as well. And then, of course, for Howie and I, it really comes down to this, partial extraction therapy, socket shielding, submerging roots, and, of course, pontic shield when we can't secure the implant. But everybody in the room is going to say, but what is the risk? How do you assess that risk? What do I do, and how do I evaluate the case? For us, risk assessment is quite focused, and many of us would say, we look at buccal bone integrity. I think everybody had talked about that. Earlier failures occur when that buccal bone isn't there. There's an incidence of recession, as Joe Kahn had mentioned. The thickness of the labial plate, increased in bone loss and recession. Again, in Ferris's article, when there was less than one millimeter of thickness of that buccal plate. The IHB, something that we published on in 98, and then again in 2007, we talked about the papilla being dependent upon the interproximal height of bone of the adjacent tooth or structure. The gingival morphotype, obviously many different publications on this, we all know, all know the importance, increased levels of recession in thin biotypes. The implant diameter, I think Sonia Lazy talked about it this morning, using smaller diameter implants, placing those implants more towards the lingual. And of course, the jump gap, or the gap between the socket wall and the implant. How far should we be? What is ideal in those situations? And of course, primary stability. If we don't have it, there's no doubt an increase in the risk of implant failure. So if we take a look at the extraction site, I think already it's been talked about. Very often, and most often, it is quite thin. That bone cannot be dependent upon because it's typically less than one millimeter in a large volume of our cases. And I think Danny alluded to the fact that only a very small amount of cases that he was able to place implants immediately because the bone was not thick enough. If we take a look at a lot of the literature, and we can debate which of these articles were more suitable for discussion, but they all related to the fact that even within early time frames, there was a significant and abrupt resorption of that buccal plate, even when grafted. And if we take a look at the blood supply, Dennis alluded to the fact that when there's very, very thin labial plate, you basically have no cancellous bone and no blood supply within that cortical plate. It's basically two cortical plates, the buccal and the palatal, touching one another. So we are dependent upon the superperiosteal blood vessels, intracrestal, and periodontal blood vessels to keep 
that labial plate nourished. So for us, we're going to tell you that in our review of all our cases, we would say that there's a place for every one of these techniques for us, Howie and myself. We looked at it and said, do we have a consensus, at least amongst ourselves, before we sit there and debate and discuss it with the other teams? And I would say to today, Howie, I think that you and I agree on this, and we mulled over quite a few cases. For every case we're showing you, there was at least two that were thrown out of our presentation, is that I think contour grafting and delaying the case, probably early or delayed therapies, is best in an infected site or sites that have large type 2 or type 3 defects. I think it's less of a risk in that area. I would have to agree with you, Danny, that for me today, I think I lean towards dual zone therapy probably more in the thicker type cases, just as a comfort level. And then, of course, if I looked over to Alessandro and Andrea, uh, guys, I would say that for us and for me today, using SVG and putting tissue in the tissue zone, bone in the bone zone, has been quite successful when I'm looking at thin tissue type cases or thin bone cases when PET isn't indicated, when there's a reason that I wouldn't pursue PET, whether it be because of a vertical fracture or infection at the apex. For most other cases where there's a healthy root remaining, healthy root fragments remaining within bone, today Howie and I would agree that we would pursue a partial extraction therapy procedure. But we need to know what it is and how to do it. And over the course of the next several uh, minutes, and uh, actually hour or so, we're going to actually talk exactly about what that means. <laughs> so let's talk about these defects. Here's a delayed case. We wait. 8 to 12 weeks, we come back. This actually looks quite similar to some of the cases Danny showed. We went ahead, placed the implants. We always want to know where the interproximal peaks of bone is because those are going to dictate to us whether or not the papilla will rebound. We utilize, unlike actually the previous two groups, we do use blood-borne bioactive modifiers. In this case, this is PRGF, and you saw Eduardo Onitwa's beautiful work this morning. This is PRGF Enderet. We mix the bone, we place the implant within the alveolus, and we use multiple layers of fibrin and collagen. This is a type two defect, a delayed placement. This is very typical to what you saw earlier this morning. We come back after several months of healing and we can then reshape the tissue. This is a case I did with Henry in Atlanta. And he was able to do a very nice job reshaping the tissue because the papilla is supported by bone. There was no damage to the bone. And he can then shape that tissue in the temporary, much of what you saw Stephen do beautifully with Dennis's work, and reconstitute a fairly effective aesthetic result. This is six years post-op, delayed GBR. And I'm proud to say my brother, who really disliked the patient very, very much, Beg me not to have to treat her. I really appreciate that you completed the case. But if we take a look at extract and graft and dual zone therapy, I think Howie would say to you he has also similar viewpoints on when he would use some of these procedures. I think you're on. I think I now know why David doesn't go with him anymore because you don't get too often a chance to talk. Hey, so thanks, mate. <laughs> Shine like this. Okay. Firstly, I think before, because I'm only getting a chance to start because Maurice has taken all the glory and left me with nothing, you know, but I am the Nochlepper here. <laughs> okay. But essentially, Mo, just to say before I get a time to start, I mean, how cool is it to be on a podium with every single one of the people that you looked up to at Perio School and who taught you? and who is now Dennis Tarnow, Danny Booza, Stephen Chu, um, Maurice <laughs> Salama. You know, it's just like for me as a person to be here, Dennis, <coughs> Danny, it's, uh, it's just such an honor. Really it is, and to say that and for me to be here, it's really, really cool. Thank you so much for having me here. I feel a little bit out of place with all of you gurus and me. But just to go through this case and to take <coughs> further, um, Certainly the one thing that we do, I've been doing dual zone therapy, I didn't know it was called dual zone therapy, but I've been doing it for many, many years, packing that buckle plate, trying to keep the implant as far away from the, from the buckle plate as possible, putting bone in, 
Um, I didn't get as good results as uh, Dennis and Stephen are getting, so we started to add the, the, uh, the uh, uh, surgical veneer graft, which I also didn't know was called the surgical veneer graft until the other day. <laughs> Okay, now I know it's called the surgical veneer graft. But we were adding all these things because of the fact that we were getting not absolutely ultimate uh, results that we were expecting. What people were showing is not what I'm getting, and maybe I'm not as good as the other people, but I'm looking in the long term to try and get that stability, and it just wasn't happening. And we'd do the classic kind of scenario, pack everything, you'd see everything at integration assessment. I think Thomas Linkovicius, you'll, you'll be happy with the amount of tissue that we got. We're thickening the tissue. Maybe this plays a part to actually help to keep the bone in place because we're thickening the tissue. We've got three and a half mils. You can see the phenomenal expansion of tissue that we get from the surgical veneer graft, which uh, Uli Grinder also in his 2011 article showed that we expand the tissue by about 0.5 millimeters, and certainly it's one of those things that worked extensively well for me. And it's something I believe very, very important when we look at the new techniques that come out. If I use a new technique and for the first three times I fail, the chances are that you're only seeing one success out of 10 that was published. If you can take a technique and you can make that technique the first or the second time and it works for you and then it consistently works, the chances are the author is being honest. And that's what I, that's the way I look at it. And this is certainly one of those techniques that really works. And if we look at the five-year post-op, and uh, unfortunately I don't have a Stephen Chu or a David Garber to do my prosto. <laughs> you know, we can only get from Zimbabwe across the road and we don't have... I don't know, we got that, what's, what's that we call, we come from Africa, there's that country, what did, you, what did your president call it? I won't say anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that we can get these kind of results, we can develop these kind of results if we add all the things together, if we look at the right type, if we look at the right uh, morphology of the, of the socket, if we have the right thickness. There's so much great data now that we have since 2009 when, when uh, Danny and, and Stephen Chen brought out that article that made us really stand up and look at our work on a critical basis as to whether it actually works that well. And if we look at this pre-op, that's what it looked like. We had a fairly thick uh, tissue on the uh, bone on the outside. And if we look at it afterwards, we actually can measure that we've got a 2.2 millimeters of bone. Okay? So a success, something that really, really works well. And it's something that we get <clears throat> on a regular basis, but is it predictable enough?